Hello everyone, hope everybody's doing well as Oda decides to hype up his own story by using a narrator voice, which appears to be speaking to us from the future. Just reading that section made me feel like I was reading some kind of jump festa statement. It's worth mentioning that as far as I can remember, Oda has only used this type of narrative intervention twice in the story before, the first one being the fight between Blackbeard and Ace at Bonero Island, in which the narrator says that this fight would later be described as the trigger of a very big incident. Now, if we take this at face value and we believe what we are told this week, then that necessarily means that what is about to happen in Egghead is going to end up having consequences and repercussions that are larger in scale than Flame Emperor Sabo's revolution, than Kid versus Shanks, than Law versus Blackbeard, and then also than Garp trying to rescue Kobe. Now, of course, a second example of Oda using this type of narrator voice comes at the end of Just Rosa during the formation of the Grand Fleet, which kind of gets you to wonder if this upcoming event in Egghead and the Grand Fleet will end up being intertwined somehow. Now, the language that is used in Dress Rosa states that after this moment, the members will each grow in power until they eventually cause a great incident of historic proportions. And this goes along with what Bartolomeo says as he's about to finish off Gladius because he states that even though his skills are not good enough at that moment, he will continue to get stronger and stronger so that one day in the future, he will be ready to help Luffy Senpai out. We also get the formation of a new alliance between Judge and Caesar Clown. And I'm assuming that they're going to be trying to find Vegapunk. Then again, their course of action might be different depending on what the big incident turns out to be. A neat little side quest that I thought about would be for them to try and rescue Queen. Because maybe Green Bull ended up taking King and Queen together into custody to the same location. So if Neo Mads is able to track Queen down, they might be able to free not just King and Queen together, but they might also run into Weevil. And given what Bakken said to Marco, I'm pretty sure that both Judge and Caesar actually know Weevil's origin story. So we might be able to get some exposition that way from them. And one of the things that we hear Stussy tell Santamaru about why Egghead is such a big deal, such a big problem for the government, is because Vegapunk has actually been expanding on the research that was being conducted in O'Hara and taking it much further. And here it's worth noting that one of the things that we did see back in O'Hara within the Tree of Knowledge was this model of the One Piece world surrounded by several orbiting celestial bodies or satellites, which implies that the archeologists back then were interested in studying space. So with that in mind, if we go back to NL's cover story, the Jolly Roger design with the giant forehead that we see on some of the space pirates there definitely seemed to implicate Vegapunk to some degree. In addition, the electric spears that we see used in that cover story also seem to implicate Judge. So what could be worse for the world government than a group of scholars studying space down on Earth? Well, I think the answer to that is scholars studying space up in space. Brief reminder here that the Celestial Dragons are known to dress up as astronauts. And speaking of upcoming attractions, there are two locations in addition to Laugh Tale in the world of One Piece that are currently unknown. They're huge mystery boxes. And so given that we're moving towards the end and exploring the final portion of the map, they have to come into play at some point soon in the story. So we'll be looking into these two mystery locations today as well. The traitor turns out to be York in this chapter, and there's a positive side and a negative side to that reveal. Uh, the positive side is that not a whole lot of people saw it coming. Very few people, if any, predicted that York would be the traitor. So if Oda's goal was to be unpredictable, I think that was, that was accomplished. I think Oda was able to pull that off because, again, very few people guessed that it would be York. The downside of that, though, is that the reason why nobody guessed that it would be York or the reason why very few people guessed that it would be her is because her character did not receive a whole lot of focus. She was just this character that was in the corner, eating, pooping, and sleeping. Which, I'll admit, does align with her, I guess you could call it, ambition of wanting to become a Celestial Dragon, because in terms of productivity, that's what Celestial Dragons kind of do all day. And then she's also the satellite for greed, so that makes sense as well. Which, by the way, I think kind of introduces like this cool idea of, since we know that York is actually part of Stella, right? You know, all the satellites, they're, they're, they're different parts of Vegapunk. So to me, that just gets me to think that there's this dark side to Vegapunk and that Vegapunk at one point or another also wanted to become a Celestial Dragon or secretly yearns to become a Celestial Dragon. But I guess up until now, he's always been able to keep that desire in check. So I appreciated that three-dimensional facet because it just makes it more real. Because part of being a human being is that you know, sometimes we do have these uh, dark, dark desires or dark intentions in us. We just don't let them take control. 
but they're in us because we're human. And so this new development is kind of saying like, well, this is what would happen if you allowed that dark side of you to take over, to take control. What would happen is what, what York is doing, right? She's trying to take out all the other parts, all the other Vegapunks. And so at this point, I believe that only her and Atlas are left, right? All the other ones appear to be either dead or taken care of. And going back to my original point, the reveal was good in the sense that very few people saw it coming, but at the same time, the impact of the reveal wasn't very much. Like, it wasn't too impactful because, again, we didn't really get to know too much about York to begin with. It's not like the comments this week were like, oh my gosh, it was York all along. How could she? She was such a good person. No, no. It was more like, it was York. Okay, let's move on. The question I'm left with is, when did S. Snake undo the petrification on York? But I think there must have been a moment after she steps on Pythagoras after the explosion, I think it's Frankie who says, no, wait, hey, stop. So I'm guessing that she's walking away to get to York so that she can undo the petrification. Also, like I said in my last video, the fact that Frankie isn't fully turned to stone, that's for a reason. It wasn't just like Oda decided to randomly spare half of Frankie's body from turning to stone. Like, no, that, that has to serve a purpose. And given that Robin's group seems to be headed towards where York is, it's likely that we might end up getting another giant Robin versus giant person clash. Now, if you've been reading One Piece for a while, you probably know that sometimes Oda ends up being a victim to Luffy's own power. And what I mean by that is this. In a lot of arcs, probably the majority of them, Oda finds himself in a position where he realizes that he's made Luffy too strong for his own good. So if Oda were to let Luffy just go all out or run wild from the very beginning, in a lot of arcs, that would actually end up resolving the conflict of the arc a lot sooner. So he has to come up with obstacles for Luffy. He has to come up with these narrative walls that Luffy can't beat right away. In Skypiea, he gets eaten by a snake. In Water 7, he gets trapped between two buildings. In Punk Hazard, he gets thrown into a dump. In Dress Rosa, Pika changes the terrain of the island, and then Luffy is forced to fight Bellamy again, even though he doesn't want to, to get to Doflamingo. So there's a bunch of examples like that, and so in this case, in Egghead, Esper is the wall, right? It's the narrative obstacle that is stalling Luffy. Now, by going back and analyzing some of the previous panels that feature the fighting style of the Seraphim, Reddit user the Invader Al one noticed that unlike King, the Seraphim have to deactivate their flame on their back to be able to use their devil fruit powers. So when the Seraphim are using their devil fruit powers, that's the time to strike. That's when they're most vulnerable because their defense is down. And so the fact that both Luffy and Zoro have partners is helpful because then Luchi and Usopp can be used as distractions for the Seraphims. They can be used as decoys to create an opening for Luffy and Zoro so that they can attack the Seraphim when they use their devil fruit powers. Now, something interesting about Sanji tanking the S shark hit is that it gets me to question like, wh what is this? Like, what's he using in that scene? Is this his Germa exoskeleton? Because if it is, right, we know that when Queen swung a sword at him, that swing dented his face, and that's not what happens here. So does that mean that S-Shark's punch is significantly weaker than Queen's swing? Or is there something else going on here? Like, could this be Sanji's Lunarian side maybe kicking in as defense? Because he attributes being able to tank the hit to emotion. He says this is the power of love, which is exactly what Judge wanted to remove from him, and it's also why Zora sacrificed herself for so that one of her children could have emotions. And so when it comes to Sanji's fire, the explanation that Oda always gives us is that Sanji's fire is due to his feelings. It's due to his passion. It's due to his heart, which is kind of what Sanji says in this scene. So again, could this be his Lunarian genes kicking in? And we could also actually connect this to Luffy as well when Kaido says, why doesn't fire affect you? And Luffy says, guts. So as of right now, the only conclusion I can think of is that both Luffy and Sanji might have Lunarian genes in that. Them. We get another moment of Bonnie crying, which she has done a lot of recently. She looks extremely distraught in this one, though, which I'm guessing that means that she's done watching Kuma's flashback. And for me, Kuma's flashback was one of the most important plot points, one of the most important sort of mysteries of this egghead arc. So it's unfortunate to see it fall victim to the powers of the off-screen, off-screen no-me in this case. We see the Navy mobilizing, and I think that, like, the big incident has to do with either Kizaru or Jay Garcia Saturn, or both. I feel like somebody 
somebody has to be defeated or captured in order for the dominoes to start falling. There could also be another betrayal in addition to York, just like Doflamingo predicted. An interesting plot twist would be to see Saturn betraying the government here. Well, and then also the reason for why this mysterious upcoming event is going to end up affecting the whole world will probably have a lot to do with punk records. Because Vegapunk said that he wanted everyone all over the world to have access to his library. So it could be that maybe that's how the news about the incident and the research going on at Egghead gets out. That's what causes a world war because people find out the truth. I also think this is where Kuma's power would have to come into play as well in allowing Vegapunk to transmit information all over the world. We know that Oda is a huge Star Wars fan, and so this is beginning to feel a lot like a Rogue One scenario, where the Rebels actually end up getting the truth out just in time, but then the Empire shows up with a weapon of mass destruction. Also, just as a very quick side note here, the official translation makes it seem as if Saturn, the Gorosei, the, the Elder, needs Kizaru to be there for his own protection. The translation says, anticipating a counterattack by Vegapunk, the elders chose to make a visit in person with Admiral Kizaru as protection. So we don't know for sure, and we won't know for sure until we see the full fighting capability of the Gorosei, or lack thereof. But for now, the official translation does make it seem as if Kizaru is the elders' bodyguard. And into that situation sailed the ship of Straw Hat Luffy, Yonko, Emperor of the Sea. That still doesn't feel real. Also, the official translation makes it seem as if York was promised the rank of Celestial Dragon if she were to cooperate with the government because she says, hey, Stella, guess what? Or, you know what? I'm going to be a Celestial Dragon. So I think that's what she was promised, but I think it's obvious that she was being misled because when we saw Luchi's group heading towards Egghead, uh, CP0 said, we're, we're there to kill all the satellites. No exceptions. And so as we head into this apparent major cataclysmic event, I think it's as good as time as any to recall two important locations, in addition to Laugh Tale, that Oda has name-dropped in the story, but has refused to show. First one being the Island of Lodestar. So what do we know about Lodestar? Well, according to what we learned in Zo, Lodestar is the island where you would typically go first to learn about the Poneglyphs and about the existence of Laugh Tale. And it also happens to be the final point on the map of the Grand Line, where all log poses eventually converge. Now, when Roger got to Lodestar, he noticed that the needles of his log post had gone crazy, and just kept on spinning. And so this convinced Roger that Lodestar was not, in fact, the final island, and that the actual place he was looking for was an island that existed even beyond the end of the path. So he needed to find another way of getting there. And that, of course, is what the red poneglyphs are for. So in other words, if you follow the red poneglyphs, you get to Laugh Tail. But if you just follow the needles on the log post, you get to Lodestar. Now, Roger also says that Lodestar was an island where no one had set foot on before, which to me means that the access to it must be blocked or restricted by something. And the anime shows that when Roger and his crew get to Lodestar, they use a little boat to disembark. So I thought that was interesting. You know, why is that? Why not just dock the Oda Jackson somewhere along the coast or the shore? Well, I believe that it's because Lodestar, just like Laugh Tail, is not a normal island. Back in Punk Hazard, we see that Luffy and his group have to use the Mini Mary to be able to get on land because the sea is literally on fire due to the aftermath of Akainu's power. Plus, Nami even says that Punk Hazard is not a normal island because none of the three needles on her log post point to it. And we also know that Punk Hazard is a restricted island, according to the government. So either the fight between Akainu and Aokiji was so intense that it somehow altered or erased the island's magnetic field, or the government did something to the island so that people would not be able to find it so easily. Now, similar to what happened to Roger at Lodestar, when the Straw Hats first enter the Grand Line, Nami notices that their compass doesn't work that it just keeps spinning. So it's possible that somebody from the Void Century could have provoked the same type of effect at Lodestar, possibly with the awakened power of Kid's Double Fruit, to prevent people from reaching Laugh Tale. And maybe this is why Oda said that he knew all the way back in Sabodi that Kid would be important later down the line. Now, the definition of the word Lodestar has two meanings. The first one refers to an actual star that navigators can use to guide the course of a ship. However, the term Lodestar can also be used to refer to an actual person, specifically a person that guides, an instructor, a role model of sorts. So it's interesting to me that when Crocus meets the Straw Hats, he says, 
I wonder if they are the pirates that we've been waiting for. Furthermore, Crocus was a former member of the Roger Pirates, and we found him at the bottom of Reverse Mountain at Twin Capes, which is the entry point of the Red Line into the Grand Line. Then we keep going and we run into the Red Line again at the midpoint of the journey to find another member of the Roger Pirates, Rayleigh, waiting at Sabote Archipelago. So if Crocus is at the beginning and Rayleigh is at the middle, it is incredibly likely that we will find Scopper Gabin at the end. It could be possible that maybe Roger instructed certain members of his crew to lay low in specific strategic locations within the Grand Line to see if somebody would show up that was worthy enough to get to Laugh Tail. Maybe he instructed Scopper to take care of the Oro Jackson and the giant egg that we've seen aboard it. By the way, I've been talking a lot about birds recently and the importance of winged creatures in the lore of One Piece, so I was pleasantly surprised to discover that the word Gaban is also the name of a bird, specifically of a stork. And so the second location that I was referring to is the Summit of High West, which as we know is the second option that people from down below can use to reach Skypea. Obviously we already know that the knock upstream is like the all or nothing gamble, right? Because if you use that pathway, either everybody lives or everybody dies. There is no in between. So either the entire crew gets up to Sky Island or nobody does. However, if you decide to take the path to Skypea from the peak of High West, you risk losing people in the process. So some people might get to Skypea and some people might not. And that pathway also requires you to pass by a couple of Sky Islands or through a couple of Sky Islands via a process called island hopping. And something that I've been thinking about recently is that Dr. Hero Look says or describes himself as a thief who came from the West. And so according to the story that he tells Chopper, right, he at one point he was very ill, he was about to die, and he came across this mountain. And at the top of this mountain, he saw these cherry blossoms. And the sight of those cherry blossoms cured him because it had an effect on his emotions. At least that's the story that he tells Chopper. So putting two and two together, Hero Look says that he came from the West and that he climbed up a mountain. So I'm wondering, is that the same place as the peak of High West? And if so, because of the cherry blossom trees, could that also be the same place where Roger meets Whitebeard one last time? So just like I think that Lodestar is going to end up being relevant because it's going to tie into Scopper, I also think that if it does in fact turn out that the place that Hero Look spoke about is in fact High West, then that's also going to be relevant for the story because it's going to be relevant for Chopper. But then also, if there really is going to be this sort of massive world war of sorts, if there's going to be this global conflict where everybody's going to be involved, one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is that when it comes to the Skypeans, the Skypeans, like, they're kind of disconnected from the, the Blue Sea, right, or from, from the people down below. So I always thought, well, if, if there is a conflict, if a conflict erupts, how are the Skypeans going to get their hands dirty? Like, how will they be able to get involved in the conflict and support Luffy if they wish to do so? And so I thought about it and I was like, wait, there's one person that we know of that has used the path of High West to get to Skypea. And this person happens to be a friend of Luffy's. Well, he's sort of associated or kind of affiliated to the Grand Fleet. He's not necessarily a member of the Grand Fleet or a representative, but he has Luffy's Vivri card, and that character is Bellamy. So in Dressrosa, Gat says that Bellamy brought back a pillar of gold for Doflamingo from a distant country. And then later on, Bellamy actually tells Luffy that, yeah, he actually did go to Skypea. And we know for a fact that he used the Peak of High West to get there, because not only does Bellamy's Double Fruit allow him to hop, so he can, like, island hop, go through that process of island hopping. But then also Bellamy tells Luffy that he lost his crew in the process. And so the last time we saw Bellamy, he was in this island that was in charge of producing pirate flags. And they were, they were producing flags, but they were using a special type of cloth, a cloth that is said to be unrippable, can't be torn, you can't tear it. And one of the hidden flags there actually belonged to the Red Hair Pirates. And we also saw that Bellamy was starting to work on this flag with the Straw Hat Jolly Roger on it. So if we connect the following dots, the fact that Bellamy is an ally-ish, the fact that he knows a pathway into Skypea, the fact that if this is going to turn into this massive global conflict, the Skypeans have to play a role because they have warriors. They have people like Wiper in their ranks. Plus, they also use dials, which are very useful. So could it be that in the future, we perhaps see the pathway of High West not being used to get up to Skypea, 
but instead being used by the Skypean forces as a way to get down to be able to reach the main conflict. Maybe that's how Rouge comes into the story as well. And that is going to do it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching and for all of your support with the likes and the subscriptions. Let me know your thoughts about the points that I raised in the video. Take care. Catch you guys later. Bye.